Good evening, my friends, and welcome back. Welcome to Into the Enlightenment, Chapter 2. First, uh, I want to thank everybody for being out here tonight. I understand that uh, the commute was perhaps not so smooth. However, I will endeavor to make it worth your while. So thank you for being here. We're going to start off this odyssey into the genesis and the evolution of the symphony by looking, if I can call your attention to the image on the screen, and perhaps uh, if we could dim the light just in the front so we might see that image a little bit more clearly. Yum. Now, maybe uh, some of you have had dinner and haven't had dessert yet. Uh, perhaps this image of the Hershey Symphony Bar is evoking all sorts of thoughts and memories. Let's talk for a minute about why the Hershey Company would call a chocolate bar a symphony. After all, Hershey already makes chocolate bars that are not symphonies. And those chocolate bars are successful and have led to the prosperity of the Hershey Company. But this symphony bar is of a different rank, I think we would say. As far as chocolate bars go, this one's in a different league. A symphony, after all, is not just a monochromatic flavor of chocolate, a.k.a. sugar. No, what do we have in this one? Creamy milk, chocolate, almonds, and toffee chips. Mmm, delectable. Yes, and if anybody needs a good dentist, as it happens, I can recommend one. <laughs> In all seriousness, the Hershey Company's decision to name a chocolate bar after a sim the word symphony, call it a symphony, is very telling. What it suggests is that this is not just an ordinary chocolate bar. No, this is a sophisticated chocolate bar. This is a chocolate bar that has an elevated sense of polish and and an elite quality to it. And of course, that's going to be reflected in the price. Because instead of paying the dollar for your average brown wrapper Hershey bar, for the symphony, you're going to get more. And so you're going to have to pay more. And it's really a very clever bit of marketing because for the average person who perhaps does or does not know a lot about the history of music in the Enlightenment period and does not know about the origin of the symphony, Nonetheless, the word symphony is a very familiar one. And what does it conjure up to the average person when you say a symphony? Oh, I'm going to hear a symphony. It suggests something sophisticated, intricate, nuanced, detailed, and fit to be served to only those with the finest palate. In other words, I don't eat regular brown wrapper chocolate bars. I eat symphony bars. The idea being... I suppose this was, if you could be a fly on the wall in the, the marketing room as the, the team is working on what to call this chocolate bar, perhaps we can imagine that what they thought is a symphony, it's, it's unlikely that they had a musicologist in the room to explain exactly what a symphony is, but nonetheless they probably thought it sounds sophisticated, it sounds elevated, it sounds like it's fit to be served to a higher tier audience an upper crust clientele as opposed to that brown wrapper chocolate bar. It also suggests, I'd like to imagine this crossed their minds, although it may not have. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit. That a symphony is a marriage of many disparate elements, which we will discuss today. And therefore, this is not just a bland chocolate bar, but rather a chocolate bar that has almonds and toffee chips. So you're incorporating more elements into the final product, and that final product is therefore going to have that appeal that we discussed. The Hyundai company, by the way, it's a South Korean car company, has a similar idea with a sedan, which they call the Sonata. Why well, call a car a Sonata? After all, this, the word Sonata comes from the Italian sonare, which simply means to sound. Well, when we think of cars and sounds, Usually that's not a very pleasant combination. It's usually the Doppler effect as you're standing or walking down a street and you hear cars going by to and fro. So calling this, this chocolate bar a symphony almost gives them a justification for ramping up the price, does it not? Because you're suggesting 
that this bar is a sophisticated bar. It's not an ordinary bar. And this is the perception I think many people have when they hear the word symphony. It evokes, it conjures up all sorts of images, tuxedos and perhaps uh, sequin gowns and flutes of champagne. Well, I hate to dash that image, but in the early days of the symphony, this was not the case. People went to hear symphonies. They would play cards during the symphonies. They would eat sandwiches. They might bring a checkers board. Not much joking. The, um, the tenor, that is to say the atmosphere, the ambiance at a symphony, depending on where you were in Europe and in what year, may have been more akin to attending WWE Smackdown with people hooting to express their displeasure at the performance or the piece itself, or people chanting and, and chanting in the middle of movements. We don't think of that. We think of the, when we go to hear a symphony, we sit in a very solemn and meditative stance, do we not? We almost treat it as a temple. And we even wait until the end of the movement to cough. Such is our discipline, as refined as it has become in the steady evolution of symphonic appreciation. But in the early days, well, the symphony was much different. So where does this word come from? Well, the truth is that the word symphony can be found. It has many musical precedents that date to well before the classical period. But the symphony as you know it, as I know it, as we as a society in the Western world know it, really is a creation of the classical period, of the Enlightenment era say, the middle of the 18th century. This is the genesis of the symphony as we know it. Now, you can go back to Bach, and you can find keyboard works that open, and it says, Sinfonia. What, a keyboard work? Sinfonia? What is, well, all it simply means, it comes from a Greek word, and all it alludes to or describes is a concordance of sound, harmony, if you will. That's, that's all the word means. There's nothing in the etymology of the word symphony that suggests the imagery that all of us are imagining right now of an orchestra configured in a certain way, dominated by strings, augmented with winds and brass, and perhaps even percussion. That's an image that we conjure up because it's the familiar one for us. It was not the familiar one to people in the 1750s and 60s who were going to hear symphonies. Now, last week we talked about some of the social changes happening in Europe in the 18th century. We talked about how society was becoming less dogmatically orthodox in its adherence to Christianity. We looked at examples of that in Bach's sons, especially his youngest son, J.C. Bach, who converted to Catholicism so he could work as an organist in Milan and then went to live in Anglican England. We talked about the change stylistically, aesthetically, away from the polyphonic complexity of Bach and Handel and the fugue and the intertwining of independent musical lines into a new style which would be based on homophonic texture where melody reigns supreme, where the composer intends for you to walk away from that concert and the composer would be delighted if you can hum, sing, whistle, or otherwise tap out the melody that you just heard. In other words, they are engineering the music to bow into your tympanium, into your hippocampus, to get into your ear. And so the music becomes more melodic. The music becomes simpler. And so the symphony is going to be based around a lot of these principles. Yes, it does involve an orchestra. And an orchestra in the 18th century is a bit hard to nail down because it's steadily growing and evolving. But in the early days of the symphony, you might be surprised at what this would have looked like. And we're going to watch a video, which I think many of you, if you, especially if you like symphonic repertoire, I would surmise you have perhaps never seen anything quite like what we're going to watch when we look at an early symphony by Josef Haydn, Symphony Number no. 6. If you're wondering, Symphony Number no. 6, how many did he write? 106. There are 104 in the Hoboken catalog, but modern musicology puts the number actually at 106 that are at, attributed to Franz Josef Haydn. So this is a very early piece for him. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about Haydn's biography, give you a sense of who he was, how he grew up, and how he was able to forge this remarkable legacy 
I mean, let's face it, folks, 106 symphonies, there's nobody in the canon that comes close to that. Mozart gave us an impressive number at 41 for a man who died at the age of 35, a month shy of 36. Perhaps Mozart would have eclipsed Haydn had he lived to be Haydn's age. Haydn was in his late 70s when he passed. Late 70s. Ancient by the standards of the 18th century. Actually, Haydn would die in 1809, so he, he lives into the, uh, he, he lives to see the, uh, the rise of Beethoven. That's how long Haydn lives. He's born while Bach is still alive, and Bach is, you know, practicing his craft in Leipzig, writing church cantatas and writing music for the Coffee House concert series in Leipzig. Yes, Bach performed uh, regularly in a Coffee House series. We also tend to think of Bach's music as very solemn, but that is not always the case. So Haydn has a remarkably long life. He's Austrian. He's not German. It's sometimes said that, oh, so many composers are German. It's more accurate to say that so many great composers in the canon were German speakers. Because many of them, including Haydn, including Mozart, including Schubert, were Austrian. Haydn has a unique combination in his life of attributes that allows him to ascend to the rank of not only one of the most successful musicians in history, but also one of the most highly compensated by the end of his life. And perhaps some of you have heard the expression, I'd rather be lucky than good. Haydn was both. He was very good, but he was also exceptionally lucky. How is he lucky? Well, he gets discovered in his late 20s. Haydn was a fiddler. He was a violinist. His father was a Wainwright. He made wheels for wagons. He did not come from a long lineage of musicians as Bach did. The Bach family tree goes back to the Reformation era, to the early 16th century. All musicians, it seems, pipers and fiddlers and organists and singers, not so with Haydn. He just takes up music and has a great affinity for it. And he's essentially making a living, to use the parlance of musicians in a later generation, he's making a living playing gigs. And that means Sunday gigs at churches for the service. It means playing weddings and festivals and feast days and the like. And he gets discovered and he gets invited to serve as deputy Kapellmeister, essentially the vice Kapellmeister at the court of the family known as the Esterhazy family, a noble family in Hungary just across the border from Vienna. And so he goes there, and he works there for almost 30 years. By the way, just a few years after arriving as deputy Kapellmeister, his superior, the actual Kapellmeister, whose name is essentially lost to history, dies. And so Haydn, by the time he's about 30 years old, is essentially running the show at a major European court. So it's a huge opportunity for him, and it's a great opportunity for him to demonstrate just how good he is, and he does so. And he does so with a lot of character, as we'll see, especially when we look at the 45th symphony. Because he was born in 1732, recall that historians put the end of the Baroque period at 1750, and therefore the start of the classical period in the same year. But as we discussed last week, it does not work that way. Haydn is growing up in a time when music is changing. And perhaps you might think of it not as a steady climb, but as lurches, an unstable and erratic gait, this way and that way. Some composers are being more experimental. C.P.E. Bach, by the way, hugely experimental composer. J.C. Bach is someone who really settled into what was then emerging as the Galant style, or what we more, I think, often referred to as the classical style. So Haydn spends almost 30 years in Esterhazy, right up until 1790, when his employer, Prince Nicholas, dies. And he decides at the age of 58, you know what, I've had a good run. He's made a decent living. He saved up some money. He's going to go back. That's not the end of his career. We'll talk about what Haydn does. Instead of riding off into the sunset, he completely reinvents himself in the 1790s, surging to unprecedented heights and reaching the apex of uh, all European composers. It is not 
simply a reflection of his character that he was referred to as Papa Haydn. It was a status that he held. Composers venerated him and regarded him with great esteem, not just because he was a great composer, but and I can't stress this enough, but because he's a pioneer. And we so often take that for granted, don't we? We just assume the symphony exists and Haydn slides in and starts writing in this established style. That's what we do with music theory students on college campuses. We tell them, okay, write a sonata in the style of Mozart. Write a fugue in the style of Bach. Write an operatic aria in the style of Verdi. That's what we tell people in harmony classes at colleges when you take music and harmony classes. Write a sonata in the style of Mozart? Can you imagine asking Mozart to write a sonata in the style of Mozart? Well, of course not. It's a preposterous thought. These composers were not trying to write music in the style of anybody. They were trying to create something new. And Haydn, perhaps more than any other figure, and there are others, Stamitz, Christoph Wagenseil, Sammartini, they're important, but it's Haydn who takes all of these ideas and coalesces and swirls them and sort of molds them into a template which would become the model for over a century. So it's, it's amazing, of all the things that Haydn did, it is perhaps this pioneering spirit taking disparate elements and uniting them to create this incredible genre which continues to captivate people today. A symphony is the top of the mountain for instrumental music, along with the concerto, right? So Haydn, again, in incredibly important figure in here. Let's take a look at Haydn's Symphony Number no. 6. A very early piece. We might be surprised by the relatively small size of the orchestra here. We might also be surprised by the fact that front and center, we see someone playing a harpsichord. Now, what on earth is a harpsichord doing in a symphony orchestra? Can you imagine such a thing? Well, you have to remember, in the Baroque period, the harpsichord was not quite ubiquitous, but it was present in a lot of music making because it was part of an entity within the ensemble known as the basso continuo, which essentially we would translate that today in modern terms, it's the rhythm section. Their job is to play the bass line and to harmonize that bass line by realizing chords above those bass notes. Now, how many symphonies do you know that have harpsichords in them? None. Zero, right? Most people. You'll also notice that the conductor here is playing the cello. How many times have you seen a conductor back to the audience playing the cello? Also, that would be a never. Nie in German. We have the standard complement of instruments which are going to form the backbone of any orchestra. And we sometimes call this the string ensemble. Now let's go through it. You've got violins, and there are going to be two violin parts usually. You've got violas, and then you've got cellos and basses usually playing together, separated by an octave. If you look closely, that's just about all you see are string instruments. And the camera during the performance will pan around, so that will become even more evident. In the early days, symphonies some of the very early ones were exclusively for string instruments. They were essentially chamber pieces and might have involved 12 or 15 players. Some of you, when you think of a symphony, think of Mahler or Bruckner, and you can imagine 200 people or 150 musicians in the orchestra. We're nowhere near that. And it's anachronistic to perform it that way. We're going to look at a video later on of Leonard Bernstein conducting. And Bernstein, with all his, his brilliance and charisma, was living in an era where people were just not interested so much in period authenticity. Nowadays, when you see Mozart performed or Haydn performed, often it's with 30 or fewer players, because that's the way it would have been done back then. And in this period authenticity movement that we're living in, people want to do the music the way it was meant to be done in those days. You could play Mozart symphony with 150 people, but what happens is there, there's a sort of a, a visual 
dissonance that emerges for people who are watching. Because if you hear the music and you see a huge orchestra, it just doesn't agree. Yes, these orchestras that play Mozart, that play Haydn, nowadays many of the, the European ones especially, have become fanatical about period authenticity. So they will sometimes perform it with 25 people doing a symphony. It's not uncommon. Besides strings, what else can we expect? In the early days, not much. You're going to have a few wind instruments. That's going to include bassoons. That's a bass double reed instrument. And oboes. Okay? So, just two wind instruments. Perhaps a flute as well. A couple of flutes. No clarinet yet. Clarinet's not going to be incorporated until 17... Uh, 70s, really, late 1770s. Mozart's Paris Symphony, number 31, has clarinets. So sorry, clarinetists, but uh, there's no part for you in Haydn's Symphony 6. What else can we expect? Can we expect brass instruments? Loud and bold instruments, like we heard, for those of you who were in New Canaan last night, but we heard Hagen summoning the vassals, and we heard him blaring over those contrabass trombones. Well, you're not going to get contrabass trombone. You're not going to get any trombones. Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5 is the first symphony to use trombones. Folks, that's not till 1808. We're in the 1750s right now. So we're a long way off from trombones. You're not going to get piccolos. You're not going to get English horns. Um, you're not going to get really any brass instruments besides French horns. So no trombones, no trumpets, no tubas, no euphoniums or anything like that. If you watch a Mahler symphony, you'll see dozens of brass players. Not so in the early days of the symphony. All right, without further ado, here is Haydn's Symphony Number no. 6. Notice how brief the sections are. Um, I'll talk more about this later in the program, but one of the great things about classical music as it's emerging is that composers are writing and they're using a very specific schemata, a very specific template or format that a symphony should be for an orchestra, and it should be in three or four parts. And we call these parts movements. And they're distinguished by certain factors, which we'll talk about. So here is Symphony Number no. 6 by Haydn. There. So many interesting things here. And for those of us who are familiar with symphonic repertoire, this might come as a bit of a shock. Because, well, something odd about a cellist sitting there and playing in front of the orchestra with his back to the audience. But the notion of a conductor, as we understand it today, that is to say somebody who wears a tuxedo or a, some other fanciful outfit, some regalia, if you will, and stands on a podium with a baton to cue instruments and indicate tempo and time signature. Anyone want to guess when that dates from? When, that's, when does that start? The baton, the dedicated conductor. About 1816. Yeah, so it's towards the end of Beethoven's life that that becomes a phenomenon that takes root and becomes standard convention. More likely, what you would get, folks, is you would get somebody, whoever the leader of the ensemble was. In this case, Haydn, remember, we said was a fiddler. He was a violinist. So this is probably not dissimilar from how Haydn would have conducted his symphonies, which is to say he would have stood somewhere where the uh, musicians could see him, and he would have conducted with body language, much like a chamber musician would do. The way a first violinist in a string quartet tends to lead the others. It's a nod here, a dip of the shoulder there. It's the eyebrows. It's the chin. It's a remarkable way of making music. And to some degree, the role of the conductor has become, well, rather hyperbolic in, in music. Which is not to say that conductors, the need for them has been obviated. That's not true. If you want to perform Brahms or Stravinsky, certainly, you absolutely need a conductor. And the greatest conductors in the world, the people like oh, Valery Gergiev and Gustavo Dudamel and, and others, I mean, these people are unbelievable musicians. Levine, Barenboim, they have a tremendous degree of, of musical cognizance that they're able to use and deploy to shape the music. But the truth is, when you're doing a Haydn symphony, especially an early one, you really don't need a conductor. 
the tempo is fixed. There is not a lot of rubato. Rubato comes from an Italian word meaning to steal. And this is this phenomenon in the 19th century where tempo becomes very elastic, very malleable in Chopin, in Liszt, in Brahms. You don't have that in classical music hardly at all. And if you were to have any, uh, perhaps just a broadening of the cadential phrase at the end of the movement, and that's about it. So no conductors necessary. So we have harpsichord, we have cello here as the leader, um, and we have just a few wind instruments. A couple of bobos, a flute, a couple of horns, that's it. Bassoons. So a small ensemble, a string ensemble, with this Baroque holdover of the harpsichord, which is part of the basso continuo, and um, the sound is very different. It has a, again, there's this asymmetry or dissonance, in the, not in the tones and in the frequencies, but just in the, the timbre of hearing what sounds like classical music with a harpsichord. In other words, it sounds like a gallant symphony, and yet there is this tinkling timbre, the metallic sound of the harpsichord. Um, it's unusual. If you study this kind of music, you see it often, and it's remarkable. All right, let's go ahead and look at Haydn's Symphony number 45. There are many things to say about Haydn's symphonies, and obviously that the fact that he wrote 106 precludes us from ever getting to discuss each and every one of them. And I, I know, incidentally, I want to mention this, I know Haydn scholars who don't know all the Haydn symphonies. Just like I wrote my dissertation on Bach cantatas, but there are 200 of them. And if you were to come to me and say, oh, tell me about you know, cantata 157, I'd have to think about that. No, nope, don't know it. So the sheer volume of music is staggering. And I should also point out that the classical period is one of the last periods in history where composers will ever be this prolific. To this day, nobody approaches the sheer volume of output that people mustered 250 years ago. And even the classical composers didn't write as much as the Baroque composers. There are people in the Baroque, for example, Georg Philipp Telemann, who has over 10,000 pieces in his catalog. How do you write 10,000 pieces of music? No television, that's right, no Netflix. Gosh, when we, all the students, I always tell them, I say, just imagine, if you lived in the Renaissance, you'd all be so much better at this. <laughs> what do you mean, Professor? Well, you know, you wouldn't be uh, on your phones, you wouldn't be watching Netflix, you wouldn't be, well, you'd be singing, you'd be sight reading. Um, yeah, anyway, all right. We're going to fast forward to Symphony Number no. 45, which dates from the 1770s. So we're about 20 years later now. Farewell Symphony is one of a handful of Haydn symphonies that bears a charming moniker, Farewell. Not all of the Haydn symphonies have these, these types of nicknames, but this one does. It also has the distinction of being in a minor key, which in the Enlightenment period, they preferred major keys by an overwhelming margin. Haydn, out of 106 symphonies, do you want to guess how many are in major? 95 is right, yeah. There are 11 in minor keys. 11 out of 106. So think about it this way. If you've got two basic flavors to choose from, there is a basic dichotomy in Western music that music can either be in major or it can be in minor. If you could choose from either, it stands to reason that most composers will be split somewhere near the middle, right? For purposes of introducing as much variety of sound and mood as possible, you'd mix it up, so to speak. And yet classical composers, simply put, do not. They overwhelmingly prefer major modes. Because as we've said, and many of you have seen me demonstrate this at the piano with with various, various pieces that I can conjure up to make them sound more demonic and, and threatening than they actually are when they should be charming and cheerful, there is something about the minor mode that gives people a sense of unease, 
that perhaps undermines the stability of the music, that emphasizes the nature of the dissonances, which become even more pronounced, that allows you to have certain intervallic passages, which are going to disturb the ear further. So minor modes are going to fade out in this period. And it's very easy to, to remember this. Because in music, we often say that major keys sound bright, sunny, cheerful. And this brightness, just remember enlightenment, almost like opening up the blinds and letting the sun shine in. Enlightenment. So major keys. There's a brightness to the music in this period. Mozart was even more fastidious in his adherence to writing in major keys. 39 out of 41 symphonies in major. 27 piano concerti, 25 are in major keys. 19 piano sonatas, 17 are in major. Five violin concerti, all five are in major keys. So these composers are, seems to be at least, pathologically drawn to the major mode. And there are many reasons for that. Remember in the Enlightenment period, not only is this an era where people are actively seeking to expand their horizons, to read more, to enhance their understanding of the natural world, of the reality around them. Remember we talked last week about the scientific revolution. We talked about the age of exploration and the consequences of those movements and the ripple effect they create in society. But there is another practical consideration that musicians have, and this is the first era in history where they have this consideration. Ready for this? For the first time, Enlightenment era musicians are selling tickets to their concerts. This is the emergence of the middle class. This is what this era of Western European history witnesses. And when you have a middle class, you have folks who all of a sudden have disposable income. And what do you do with disposable income? You go on Amazon. No, sorry. <laughs> wrong, wrong decade. What do you do with disposable income in the 1750s? Well, Remember, this is an era before recording technology. Magnetic steel cylinder recordings, not going to be a factor until many years later, over a century later. And even then, it's not going to be until 50 years after that that commercial recordings become prominent in a substantial portion of the population's homes. So what do you do with that money? Golly, you're going to go buy a ticket to a concert. And there are orchestras formed in this period that are some of the first orchestras that are dedicated to performing works and selling subscription tickets so that people will come and hear the music. And that's a remarkable thing to contemplate, is it not? We just imagine that music is accessible because for us it is accessible. It is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. You go to the doctor's office, music. You drive in the car, music. You walk into a Starbucks, music. It's everywhere. Imagine a world where that's not the case, where we can't go on YouTube and dial up these incredible performances of even the most obscure pieces, such as Haydn's Symphony No. 6 in D major. So it tells us a lot about how music, how prominent it was and how important it was to people that they're going to take this you know, disposable income, however much it is, and many Again, I'll use that phrase I used earlier because this is the first phrase that most sociologists, most economists believe that we can trace the rise of the middle class to this period, to the decades preceding the French Revolution. If you remember July 14, 1789. Symphony we're about to listen to dates from the 1770s, and it has a remarkable story. Remember we talked about Haydn's employment at the court of Esterhazy in Hungary? And we talked about the remarkable luck that he had to land such a position. Mozart, who possessed at least as much skill as Haydn, as Haydn himself conceded, never attained that Kapellmeister position, which was the ultimate position for a musician in those days, to have the stability of steady employment and the latitude and freedom to write music according to their own aesthetic taste. So Haydn's got this incredible gig, we'll call it, over in Hungary. But even the best jobs, you've got your off days. And as it happened, Haydn found himself in the midst of a pickle of sorts in the 1770s. Because as Kapellmeister, he is a sort of shepherd to his flock. 
His flock, of course, being the musicians who are employed at the court in Esterhazy. Now, in this particular summer, the prince, Nicholas of the house of Esterhazy, he's going to travel to his summer palace. And what do you do if you want to have music at your summer palace? You've got to take all your musicians with you. So you not, you know, in the, when I was a kid, we used to take analog cassettes. And then after that, there were CDs. Now, of course, everything is streaming. Back then, you had to bring your whole orchestra with you. If you want to enjoy your summer vacation, you've got to bring the orchestra. And so he does. The Prince Nicholas of the House of Esterhazy then he died a bit past the time when he was supposed to release his musicians from their contractual obligations and send them off for their own summer vacations to go reunite with their wives and children. And he simply forgets. There seems to have been no malice in Prince Nicholas. He was a good guy, certainly a staunch supporter of the arts, a great benefactor for Haydn, and yet musicians are bristling at having been kept several days past the time when they should have been allowed to return and enjoy their own vacation. So they go to hide and hide and help us. Now in those days you can't simply approach the prince and say, hey, what's going on? You forgot to send us home. I'm punching out. I'm done. I want overtime. I want time and a half for this. Such a thing would be unimaginable. And the musicians of that period would not have dared to even contemplate such an impulsive and impetuous move. So they go to Haydn. Haydn, being the Kapellmeister, has the prince's ear. How do we get out of here? How do we get our vacation time? So Haydn devises some edits to a symphony he had been working on. I won't tell you what they are. I think it's more interesting to watch. And what we're going to see is we're going to have this final movement which starts in a very Sturm und Drang fashion. Sturm und Drang is a German term that means storm and swell. Sometimes translated as storm and stress. But stress is not the right word. Stress is something that afflicts us when we're feeling particularly beleaguered. Swell is a better word because it suggests a kind of an up and down contour to the music. That's going to introduce dissonances and rhythmic instability and things that are going to resolve and then move out of phase and back in and so on and so forth. And then Haydn does something rather unexpected. The music moves out of F-sharp minor and becomes incredibly placid, serene, almost pastoral. Pastoral meaning evoking the rolling hillsides, nature in its most uncorrupted and unperturbed state. Why are they all of a sudden playing this pastorale at the end? Well, the prince must have been wondering the same thing. And then it would have dawned on him exactly why the orchestra was doing what they were doing. And he could have only smiled and marveled at Haydn's ingenious and very diplomatic way of raising what must have been a very delicate and sensitive issue. Here is the last movement of Haydn's Symphony of F-sharp minor, this is the Farewell Symphony. And this is the Sinfonia Rotterdam with Konrad von Eiffen conducting. All right, here we go. You gotta love music history, <laughs> right? Remember that Haydn himself was, as we've said a couple of times now, a fiddler. He was a violinist, so presumably he would have been <laughs> or the last men standing at the end of this symphony. And the prince apparently was very charmed at this sensitive and delicate way of expressing what must have been a very powerful wish on the part of the musicians, essentially, let us go home. And so Haydn does something completely unconventional and unprecedented, which is that he simply has the musicians as their part comes to a close, they get to a cadence, and they simply get up in the middle of the movement and walk off stage. So it, it tells us a lot about something we discussed earlier, which is that the symphony in its early days was not this very sober, somber event that we imagine today. That starts with Beethoven. This idea that the symphony is this 
hallowed tradition, and one has to sit there in contemplative and meditating silence to really appreciate it. That starts with Beethoven. And the reason it, it really stems from Beethoven is because Beethoven is going to use something that composers up until this point really used very sparingly, and that is silence. Beethoven uses a lot of silence and a lot of whisper quiet dynamics. And so a lot of our sensibilities as audience members grows out of this idea that we need to wait and listen as closely as possible because there might be something that we're going to miss. But here, it's more casual. Obviously, if the musicians are getting up and leaving in the middle of the movement, it's a lot more casual than that temple-like atmosphere than, that, we've, that we've discussed. All right, I want to tell you about the end of Haydn's life, and then we'll listen to an excerpt from his 94th symphony in G major. When his employer died in 1790, Haydn was approaching his 58th birthday, and by the standards of the 18th century, he was certainly entitled to a nice, comfortable retirement. He had made a good living working those nearly 30 years as the Kapellmeister to the Esterhazy family in Hungary. And he thought that he would return to Vienna, where he had spent his youth. He grew up in the city of uh, the town, I should say, of Rolau, which is one of those German words that separates the wheat from the chaff, if you try to pronounce it the way a German speaker would. It's got two German R's in it. Rolau. <sighs> well, at any rate, he's thinking of moving back to Vienna, and so he does. But he doesn't remain there for very long, because he's approached by an emissary of sorts. This man had the name Johann Peter Salomon, and he was a German who lived in England. And he made his living as a concert promoter. So this is another title, another job, another vocation that could never have existed 50 years prior. This is a product of the Enlightenment period. We talked about the middle class and the disposable income and the rise of the public concert. Well, with public concerts, you're going to get enterprising entrepreneurs like Johann Peter Salomon. And he makes a boatload of money. He goes over to England, and he becomes involved in concert promotion there. And what he's doing is he's going to go around the continent, continental Europe, and he's going to offer commissions to the best composers. Come to England, write some music for the Royal Symphony, and we'll pay you a, a lot of money. When Haydn is first approached, remember, he's a rather elderly man by the standards of those days, and moreover, getting from Vienna to London is, well, even worse than getting from Greenwich to Darien tonight. I understood it took over an hour for some people, so. In Haydn's day, to go from Vienna to London would have taken about a month in fair weather. So, imagine being in your late 50s and contemplating the reality of sitting in a covered wagon and bumping through the rutted roads of Europe on your way up to Calais to take a ship to Dover and then get in another wagon to ride up to London a couple of days later. This would not be an enticing prospect even to someone of sound composition, constitution, and health. Haydn was in good spirits and in good health at this time, but as we said earlier, his age was a factor. And his age is going to play into a conversation, a very poignant, very stirring conversation that he's going to have shortly before he leaves for London. Now, why does he leave for London if he is not inclined to do so? Well, because in the words of the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, everybody's got a price. And Haydn was offered a small fortune to write six symphonies. That sum adjusted for inflation was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a million bucks. Million one, something like that. So you could buy a nice 300 square foot apartment in, in uh, Manhattan for the amount he was offered. So he's offered this fortune and essentially acquiesces very quickly to go to England. It also seems to have been the case it wasn't just the money, but Haydn had a spirit uh, for adventuring. And so he decides to go on this. Now, before he leaves, he meets with Mozart. They had grown rather close, despite not meeting in person all that many times. Mozart has a great, he makes a, a plea with Haydn. 
not to go. And he has a great line. He says, he says, but Papa, Mozart's own father had died a couple of years prior. And he says, Papa, don't go. It's dangerous. It's a long trip. You never know what could happen. And Hyde says, don't worry about it. I'll be okay. And Mozart says, ah, oh, but, but Haydn, you don't speak the language. It's true. Haydn had no English. Mozart didn't have any English. And Haydn has an all-time comeback response. He says, Mozart, wherever I go, my language is understood. Mozart says one last thing to him, which proves to be prophetic and tragic. He says, Haydn, I have a terrible feeling that if you go on this trip, I will never see you again. And Haydn says something like, don't worry, I'll be back. And of course, Haydn, his words would prove true. He would be back. And when he arrived back in Vienna a couple years later, it was Mozart, who was 34 years old at the time of this conversation. It would be Mozart who would be dead and buried. So, all right, let's talk about uh, another famous, famously witty excerpt from a Haydn symphony. This is from Symphony 94. The scholarship is not exactly in agreement on why Haydn wrote this movement the way he did. It's the slow movement. Now, move, movements essentially refer to segments or parts of symphonies. Symphonies tend to have four movements, and it's based on the idea that they should be separated, distinguished is a better word, by tempo and by key. So if you start fast in G major, your next movement would be slow in, say, C major. And what Haydn realizes when he gets to London is that the audience is not nearly as well behaved and as well disciplined as they were back in Hungary, where they sat at the prince's pleasure. The difference in London, people are paying for those tickets, and that means they can eat sandwiches and play checkers, and they did. This was the decorum, the behavioral, behavioral typical scenario in a concert setting, in one of these concert halls where people paid to go and hear music. And so Haydn, who is, we can imagine, thunderstruck, perhaps shocked, perhaps incredulous, filled with consternation, at the sight of people talking through the symphony, decides he's going to get their attention one way or another. And he does so. This symphony is called in German the Paukenschlag, which means drum strike. Schlagen is to hit something, and Pauken are timpanies. So timpani strike might be a better rendering. In English, we call it uh, the Surprise Symphony, and it refers to the same thing. Surprise in German would be Überraschung. That'd be a heck of a name for a symphony. The Überraschungssymphonie. Rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Nonetheless, he writes the second movement in a very noteworthy and iconic way. So let's go ahead and listen to that. Here is Leonard Bernstein conducting. So we end the first movement, and we have a little break, and we go into the slow movement. So we have this simple, childlike, innocent melody, almost like a lullaby. One, three, five, three, and then outlining the dominant chord. And then just as you're lulled into a sense of tranquility, da, 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 da. Da, bang. Almost as if Haydn is saying to his London audience, wake up, I have arrived. Now, if you look closely in this video, uh, there are no women playing, which tells us that this is either the Vienna Philharmonic or the Berlin Philharmonic or some European ensemble from the 1980s, let's say, 1970s perhaps. There were no women uh, playing in these ensembles until the 80s, and even today the numbers are really lopsided. There was a, a first violinist, I think it was in the Vienna Philharmonic when Bernstein was conducting, who had a particularly boneheaded response when asked, why don't women play in the symphony orchestra? And he said something like, 
women are unsuited to the rigors, the stress of playing this music. And in doing so, this particular first violinist evinced a mentality in, say, 1974, about as progressive as somebody who would have been asked in 1774. So, um, at any rate, the 94th Symphony would not be Haydn's last. He would go on to write a dozen more, and, or really about 10 more. Um, the idiosyncrasies, let's call them, of Haydn's music as we saw in the Farewell Symphony and also in the 94th Symphony, one thing that comes up over and over again is a sense of humor. And that's one of Haydn's charms. He wrote a string quartet, Opus 33, number two in E-flat major, which is known as the Joke Quartet, which ends after a strange pause with the beginning phrase and then just sort of evaporates into nothingness, leaving the audience to presumably stare in confusion. Um, but first they've already clapped thinking it's over, and then they discovered it isn't. So Haydn's music is chock full of this, but I want to I mention that it's also filled with, on occasion, great theatrical pageantry. And if you're interested in uh, learning more about that, um, you can come to Naugatuck Valley Community College on December 7th, where the Corral is going to be singing excerpts from Haydn's Creation Oratorio. Haydn proved himself to be a remarkable composer of vocal music, or at least some types of vocal music. And that brings me to my closing remarks for tonight. We have now learned quite a bit about the genesis, the origins, and the evolution of this very familiar genre, the symphony. We've talked about how it grew out of the Baroque ensembles, that it was essentially written essentially for string instruments with just a handful of wind instruments and just a pair of horn players to represent the brass. We talked about how it was written for a smaller ensemble than most of us conjure up when we think of symphonies. We talked about how it was marketed towards an emerging middle class who could buy subscription tickets to go see concerts with their hard-earned cash. We talked about Haydn and his role as a pioneer of the symphony how he wrote over a hundred of these works, how the majority of them, like most Enlightenment era music, can be heard in major keys. And we talked about Haydn's wit and humor and how he was able to suffuse at least certain works with those attributes. But one thing Haydn was not able to do was to successfully compose operas. And he wrote a lot of them. There are over 19 operas that Haydn composed, four operas. How many of them have you ever heard of, seen staged, seen on a program somewhere? The answer for most people is zero. Haydn operas are not performed because, well, frankly, they're not great. Or at least they're not up to the standard that we associate with Haydn. One person who eclipses both Haydn and Beethoven in the realm of opera, who reigns supreme in the Enlightenment era as the most successful and dynamic composer of operas, is Mozart. And after the symphony, or perhaps Alongside the symphony, there is probably no more important genre of music in the Enlightenment era than the opera. And guess what? We're going to talk all about it next week when we look at Don Giovanni, the Nazi di Figaro, and the Zauberflöte. I wish everybody a wonderful Thanksgiving. Enjoy it. Enjoy your family. Enjoy. Hopefully we'll have some good weather, and hopefully we'll have better traffic conditions next week. Until then, my friends, good night.